So the pseudoscience charlatan Kent Hovind challenged me to a debate in a format creation is seldom used because they can't win. Usually they do live debates where you can't check their citations on the fly. And it's always been my experience that whenever creationists cite scientific research, they're either not peer-reviewed or they don't actually say what the believer says they do. I'll put a couple links below to prove that. But this is a video exchange debate where every assertion and its source can be examined and evaluated before posting a reply. And consequently, bullshit will not fly. The Gish Gallop doesn't work in this format, but Hovind still tried it anyway. Uh, the first round of this debate began with 10 minutes of introductory commentary, but only about nine and a half minutes of actual debate, wherein I answered all of Hovind's questions. His response, however, came in the form of five episodes, averaging 42 minutes of his video for every five minutes of mine, adding up to three and a half hours of total talk time, during which he accused me of having diarrhea of the mouth. There was a lot of projection in that. He doesn't know how to make response videos. Yeah, my reply will not be as long or as tedious as his, which goes against what I think he intended that if each round grows exponentially, it'll quickly become so cumbersome that the broader audience won't watch it all. So I will address the few things that do pertain to this debate because there's a, lot, there's a number of learning opportunities that should be properly instructed, such that I could make every video this month about Hovind, but I won't do it again next month. Now, he may have nothing better to do with his time than waste it, but I have a much busier schedule than Kent. So I won't let this debate be all I do all month long. I will find ways of shortening these exchanges, and he'd better do that too by posting no more than one response video per turn and having that focus only on relevant content. I will not include everything he says because he repeated himself a lot, and much of his spiel was tangential and unnecessary, sharding into every red herring, distraction, or obfuscation he could think of to bog us down in irrelevant minutia. You know, for example, now, as far as being drunk, you were sitting there sipping wine the whole time. Many people commented that you were drunk. I don't know if you were drunk or not. I've never tasted alcohol. I don't know what it's like to be drunk. But a whole bunch of people said, he's drunk. How many saw the discussion and thought he was drunk? There we go. There's a bunch of them right in here. Watch it. Just answer, were you drunk? Yes or no? No, I was not drunk, and I wasn't drinking wine either. That was beer, but it wasn't some thin yellow pilsner. I'm a bit of a beer snob, and I only drink the good stuff, and uh, my beer is an imperial stout. There were quite a lot of false accusations and petty insults that don't bother me because I'm not a narcissist, so I'm not as compulsively defensive as Hovind is, but he shows all the symptoms. I've seen comments by other viewers that his snarky remarks and facial expressions show that he is visibly butthurt by our prior exchanges and that he's obviously quite bitter about it, which is probably why he's reacting so disrespectfully now, by refusing to use my real name, for example. I mean, he obviously has a learning disability because he's still repeating errors I've already corrected before. My name doesn't have two A's in it because my name isn't Aaron, it's Aaron. But regarding my last name, he's not just being stupid. He's being deliberately disrespectful, trying to belittle me the way narcissists do when they feel criticized. And since he insists on using IDs that are years out of date, just to be rude, then as long as he calls me Nelson, I'll refer to him by his prisoner number 0645-2017. And with that out of the way, let's begin round two, which will be the longest round of this debate, or it'll be the last. He gives a dictionary, of course, dictionary, how many different dictionary definitions are there of any word? You know, you can look up quite a few different, <laughs> people pick and choose the definition they want. Remember that every logical fallacy has been used as an argument for God, and every argument for God is a logical fallacy. This includes equivocation, mixing two different definitions deceptively. And that's why I'm so careful to define my terms, to show that I'm using them correctly, and to stay within that context. 0645-2017 can't do that. No creationist can. So, of course, he objects as if our language should be ambiguous and confused so that we talk past each other, which appears to be his goal. Dwayne Gish and Henry Morris, uh, who I knew both of them fairly well, they were geniuses and they started the ministry that is today in Dallas, Texas, Institute for Creation Research. Dwayne Gish did over 300 debates against atheists and demolished them every time. No, Gish and Morris were both idiots who showed no competence at all, and Gish lost every debate I ever saw him in, just like you do. 
Shout out to Bill Ludlow and King Crocoduck, who both beat you before me. You're an easy defeat because you don't know anything. He's justifying why he interrupted me 288 times. Rather than saying, hey, I'm sorry, you're right, I interrupted you 288 times, he's justifying what he, why he did what he did. If you answer my question in a way that shows that you didn't even understand the question, I owe it to you to interrupt and explain it to you until you do understand it, rather than let you waste time answering a question no one asked. If we're going to spend this whole evening discussing Kent's credibility, uh, uh, my debating uh, tactics and your dis and discussion tactics, and you're interrupting me 288 times, we can do that, but that should be the topic of the debate then. Did Kent lie? If that's what you want to label it, okay, show me specifically where I lied. I'll be glad to, but I can both debate what you don't know about evolution and list your specific lies. For example, Aaron, the self-proclaimed atheist, Aaron Nelson is his name, he tells me it's not that anymore, but it, as far as I know, I've never seen any documentation to say any different. You said that after you've already read from my Wikipedia page, which counts as documentation that you now say you haven't seen. In that discussion, he agreed live on video that he would come back for a second round, but he went back on his word as soon as he... Oh, I did not go back on my word. We're doing it right now. But you agreed to a second live discussion with me in real time on the Non Sequitur Show. Well, let's let's do another one. Uh, set it up with Rhonda, 855 Big Dino, extension 2. She keeps the schedule. What we're doing now is a completely different idea that you had later, and not at all what you agreed to schedule with them. So you went back on your word. Evolution is a religion that people believe in. Nobody's ever seen a frog produce a non-frog or a cow produce a non-cow. You can believe it if you want, and you obviously do. No, I obviously don't believe that. That is a straw man fallacy because evolution doesn't teach that and never did. You can't produce a secular textbook to support what you said because evolution doesn't even permit that and it would violate evolutionary laws. Descent with inherent modification adheres to monophyly, meaning that every new genus or species or whatever is just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were and cannot grow out of their ancestry. So evolution allows new and different varieties of frogs, but it doesn't allow any frog to produce a non-frog, nor for an ape to produce a non-ape, which is why we are still apes. I don't think you understand what evolution really teaches. You have just proven that you don't know what evolution really teaches, or even what it is. Being in your career for this long, you have no excuse for not knowing the subject any better than that. You're demonstrating your learning disability again, because I've already corrected you on exactly this point when we spoke before. In no sense of the word is that a religion, because it is not faith-based, it's evidence-based. And it has nothing to do with any purpose for anything, much less anything to do with the beginning of the universe or what came prior to it. Nor does it require a belief. I would suggest that we both start from not believing anything and just review the possibilities. I show every night for the last 60-some nights, right from the textbooks, there was a big bang where nothing exploded, and then it, Earth cooled down, developed a hard rocky crust, and it turned into soup from the rain, and the soup came alive. That is all part of the evolution theory. No, it isn't. None of that is. The Big Bang Theory, Nucleosynthetic Theory, Stellar Formation Theory, and the Assorted Hypotheses of Abiogenesis are all distinctly separate theories. Well, except for abiogenesis, of course. And none of them are any part of evolution theory. This sort of religious distortion of scientific concepts is what physicist Wolfgang Pauli famously criticized in saying, this isn't right, this isn't even wrong. Inmate 06452017 has just given us an example of fractal wrongness, where his perspective is so wrong that any arguments to support it are also wrong on every point and at every level. He's been corrected about this plenty of times before, including by me directly over and over again. But as I said, he does not concede any of his own mistakes because those are all he has and he can't learn. So he just keeps repeating the same old lies and I have to keep repeating the same corrections to them. For example, take a look at Berkeley University's introductory primer, Evolution 101, which I know he's already seen because he said so. Notice that it shows a basic division of prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but makes no mention at all about the origin of life, nor the origin of chemicals, planets, or the cosmos. That's because evolution is not about the origin of life, the universe, and everything. 
I think he's equivocating the modern definition of the theory of evolution, descent with inherent modification in reproductive populations of living organisms over many generations, and he's confusing that with the colloquial meaning of simply any change over time, which is what evolution meant back when Darwin initially chose that word and subsequently enhanced it. He says he got all this from his textbooks, but let's check mine. This one from Pearson says that evolution is descent with modification, the idea that living species are descendants of ancestral species that are different from the present day ones. And this one from McGraw-Hill says evolution is genetic change in population of organisms. And this one from Thompson says evolution is any cumulative genetic changes in a population from generation to generation and that evolution leads to differences in populations and explains the origins of all the organisms that exist today or that have ever existed. Of course, the origin of organisms referred to what Darwin called the origin of species rather than the origin of life, because the origin of life obviously didn't begin with living ancestors, which is part of the definition of evolution. So abiogenesis is not part of evolution and neither is planetary formation nor cosmogony, all of which were grossly misrepresented by this anti-scientist. As I've already explained earlier in this very debate, evolution is not a religion for the reasons explained by my most recent video and the first part of this series. So 06452017 has no defense in repeating this lie. Likewise, the Big Bang wasn't nothing that exploded. First of all, it wasn't an absolute philosophical nothing. Not even Lawrence Krauss believes in an absolute philosophical nothing. And cosmic inflation isn't really an explosion either. Not that I want to defend the Big Bang. I accept that it's the only theory of cosmic origin and to challenge any theory I would have to produce a better theory to use in its place, but I don't really like the Big Bang, probably because I don't understand it. He jumps from there to the earth cooling down, skipping a significant step that we'll cover in a moment, but to say that the rocky crust of the earth became a soup because of the rain is just indefensibly false. To add that the soup came alive is also false and shows that he doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. As I explained in my middle school primer, abiogenesis is a multi-stage collection of overlapping processes in succession. And not only does it not necessarily depend on the primordial soup hypothesis, but it wouldn't be the soup coming alive even if it did. So everything he just said is inexcusably wrong. He even skipped out on one of his alleged intermediate stages of evolution, but he came back to it later. Well, let's do that one. All right, let's focus on this one right here. This is from Jack Chick Track, The Six Levels of Evolution, Cosmic Evolution, The Origin of Time, Space, Matter, The Big Bang. Chemical Evolution, how did all the elements get there? Did, if the Big Bang produced hydrogen, how did we get silver, platinum, and gold? I would like you to explain that. I have to wonder how it is that you've been such an active anti-scientist since at least the 1980s, yet you've somehow never heard the astronomer Fred Hoyle's explanation of nucleosynthesis? Especially since Hoyle was a creationist, albeit of a uniquely loopy sort. You've even used variants of his anti-evolution arguments. Your frog in a blender is an adaptation of Hoyle's original tornado in a junkyard. But however irrational Hoyle was, he was the first to say what physicists now think is correct that in the superheated furnace of a typical star, protons can be agitated with such velocity as to form an atomic bond upon collision. Thus, two hydrogens collide to produce helium, and a third to get lithium, and a fourth to get beryllium, and so on, adding protons and usually electrons and occasional neutrons until you get all the way up to iron. To make elements heavier than iron requires a higher energy level, meaning even hotter temperatures that usually only occur when a star goes nova. After which, of course, all those elements explode out into debris across the cosmos to later form planets in accretion. How do you not already know this? Isn't this just a high school primer to chemistry? Well, maybe not in your church. Notice that none of this should be confused with evolution. Hoyle hated evolution and Big Bang Theory. In fact, he was the one to popularize the name Big Bang in an attempt to ridicule the notion of cosmic inflation. He would be furious if he were alive today to see you lump all these different theories together. If he heard you say that his theory and the Big Bang Theory were both part of the theory of evolution, he would lose his mind if, you know, if he hadn't already. Now, in the last 10 years, when you guys' feet have been held to the fire, you've tried to narrow evolution down to variations within different animals. 
there's a whole lot more to it than that. And I give six definitions, and you're going to show it in a minute. And my six divisions of that slippery word evolution are correct. No, they never were. This is the only textbook I have that was published within the last 10 years. But it's also the 11th edition. All my other textbooks are older than that. This one, on the evolutionary process, is from 1991. Yet it doesn't include any mention of planet formation or cosmogony either. Instead, it adheres to the same definition as the other three books, which follow Darwin's original explanation, although enhanced and improved by 160 years of further research. I bought this textbook when I took a full semester course on evolution. That's 15 weeks wherein nobody brought up any of those unrelated theories in your list. We only talked about the last two on your list, which are both the same theory. Evolution is just a theory of biodiversity and nothing else. And this book, 1001 Things Everyone Should Know About Science, is not a textbook. It was published in 1992, and it says that evolution is both a fact of biology and a theory proposed by Charles Darwin explaining how life developed through mechanisms like natural selection. There's a whole chapter dedicated to evolution, and it doesn't even mention the origin of the elements or the planets or the cosmos either. The same goes for Webster's 1913 Dictionary, where evolution has a biological category, but there is not another one for the other categories that you're trying to erroneously associate. So your slippery misdefinition is a straw man. That was never correct. The real definition of evolution isn't slippery because it never changed, and it was never what you say it is. And anti-science apologists like yourself have never held any scientists' feet to the fire either, meaning that your reality-denying delusional lunatic fringe movement hasn't applied any noticeable pressure to nor made any impact on actual science whatsoever. I think you don't know anything about evolution. I think you believe a lot of things. You have a great faith. It's an admirable faith. But you don't know anything about evolution. He knows I don't have faith. He's using a fallacy of projection known as tu quo qui, also known as the U2 fallacy, because it's an attempt to project one's own faults onto opponents who will not share them. He knows there's nothing admirable about faith, either being an assertion of unreasonable conviction assumed without reason and defended against all reason. He knows that science is not faith because it is based on evidence. The science is the opposite of faith, the antithesis of faith, requiring all postulations to be objectively evident, verifiable, and potentially falsifiable. He knows from our earlier meeting that I reject faith as the most dishonest position it is possible to have. Any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. Importantly, he knows that nothing he just said here is true. He's just trying to antagonize me. That's six lies in only eight words. Throw in some additional misconceptions and you can see how 0645 2017 really could tell more lies in one sentence than there are words in that sentence as he did once in the late 1990s. However, he makes a valid point that if I can't prove it, I shouldn't say it. I commented once that he had told 21 lies in a 19-word sentence in some long-forgotten Usenet post that I can't find again after all these years, and now I wish I had the forethought to have saved it. I am not a convicted fraud. R, and listen carefully. The videotapes, KentHovenIsInnocent.com, are going to be put up on our YouTube channel, on our website, DrDino.com. You can watch for yourself. I was not convicted of fraud. Look up the word convicted. Look up the word fraud. I was not convicted of fraud. I was convicted of structuring, which is not fraud. I was convicted of not withholding taxes from employees. That we, Brady went through every single line of that charge and the conviction. I did not break any laws in that one. So I was not convicted of fraud. Why would you make a statement like that? That is not correct. That is called poisoning the well, I believe, is the fallacy there. I was not convicted of fraud. You're either confused or you're deliberately lying, but it's not true. Correct it, please, on the next one when you edit my comments here. After inmate 0645-2017 served his primary sentence, he was hit with additional charges that included mail fraud. The jury was hung on the mail fraud and conspiracy charges, and federal prosecutors moved to dismiss those charges rather than to retry the case. Maybe that's what he's pointing to when he says he wasn't convicted of fraud. However, he was frequently accused of fraud even by his own associates. Fellow creationist apologists accused him of making fraudulent claims with mistakes in facts and logic that do the creationist cause no good. In particular, 
Answers in Genesis criticized him for persistently using discredited or false arguments as well as fraudulent claims, which is what he's still doing here, as I've already pointed out. There are plenty of sources all over the web that say that he and his wife were charged with and found guilty of tax fraud. We see this in a number of publicly sourced articles, several of them, in fact. We don't just see this in the typical wiki sources either, but also in other forms of journalism, like old news stories and more straight-laced sites showing how much of what he specifically did is listed as a type of tax fraud. Specifically, inmate number 0645-2017 was convicted on one count of obstructing IRS administration. Obstruction can be a form of tax fraud. One of the means of obstruction Hovind used was paying his employees in cash so as not to have any traceable payments, and that is known as civil tax fraud. He was convicted of 12 counts of failing to collect and pay employment withholding taxes while structuring transactions to avoid financial reporting laws, which legal sites recognize as defrauding the federal government. If done with willful intent, this too is a form of tax fraud. He was also convicted of structuring, just like he said, 45 counts of structuring, which is also typically considered a subset of financial fraud. He was convicted on all counts of a 58-count indictment. He wasn't found innocent on any of them. In his failed attempt at appeal, he tried to systematically overturn every conviction by whatever feeble, pedantic, technical excuse he could think of, which included misdefinition of terms, just like he tried to defend himself against answers in Genesis. That's relevant here because he's already trying to do that same thing in our debate, too. With that in mind, and realizing that his fans would never accept what I could sufficiently prove on my own, I contacted an attorney just to make sure I'm interpreting all this correctly. Professor Nate Brody has over 15 years' experience in law enforcement, both as a criminal investigator and prosecutor in New York City. Now he teaches legal analysis and is a practicing defense attorney. Mr. Brody will explain whether any of inmate number 0645-2017's many convictions count as fraud. This is not legal advice. If you need legal advice, please see a licensed professional in your area. Hey, how you doing? My name is Nate. And today we're going to be looking at U.S. v. Hovind. It's a case out of Florida um, from 2008. Now, this is actually an appellate division case. So we're going to look at what happened on appeal after the defendants in this case were convicted. So the first thing is I don't want you to be put off by my sunglasses. I actually have an eye condition that makes my eyes very, very sensitive to light. So I wear these glasses to help me deal with bright circumstances. And obviously, here it has to be a little bright because I'm actually recording. So that's why I'm going to be wearing shades. So let's look at the case. Here is the citation for the case, and if you'd like to follow along, you can read it with us. But I'm going to attempt to look at the documents, the court documents, and go over what actually happened in the case. We're going to look at the facts, we're going to look at the pleadings, and we're also going to look at the outcomes to see what actually happened. I'm going to also explain to you some of the concepts that come up in this case and see if I can help the audience have a better understanding of what actually happened. Um, in this case with Kent and Joe Hovind. And last but not least, we're going to be specifically looking at what Kent Hovind did, and we're not really going to be looking at Joe Hovind, but what we'll do is I'll be mentioning her name because as part of the story, but we're really going to be focusing on, on what Kent Hovind did and what he was convicted of. The court reports that defendants Kent and Joe Hovind were convicted, and they were convicted in the United States District Court of the Northern District of Florida, and they were convicted of failing to collect and pay employment withholding taxes, obstructing tax laws, and structuring cash transactions to avoid financial reporting laws. And we'll go into exactly what all that is. And also, I'll be explaining to you some topics that also relate to it. What is cash structuring? What, what is employment um, withholding taxes? And those type of things. So with any legal case, you have to start with the facts because the facts drive exactly what happened and how um, if there were any violations of the law. So this is how the court describes the facts in this case. The court says the Hovinds owned and operated Creation Science Evangelism Enterprises, which sold videos and literature, provided a lecture service, and hosted live debates. Between 1999 and 2003, the Hovinds withdrew from AM South Bank over one and a half million dollars in increments less than $10,000 to avoid federal filing requirements. 
Company documents and records of the transactions established that Joe controlled the finances of Evangelism Enterprises and controlled most of the checks that were cashed. Now, Kent Hovind oversaw the payroll and related federal tax obligations, and Kent failed to withhold or pay quarterly federal withholding taxes or filed related tax documents with the Internal Revenue Service between 2001 and 2003. Now, the Hovinds were charged with a 58-count indictment and were convicted on all 58 counts. Now, this indictment was broken up into three parts. It was first, the first 12 counts of the indictment were for willfully failing to deduct and pay federal income taxes for employees of the evangelism enterprises. The next 45 counts of the indictment for, for, were for cash structuring to avoid financial reporting requirements. The last count of the indictment was Kent Hovind's charge with obstructing the administration of the internal revenue laws. So first, let's look at the first 12 counts of the indictment, which Mr. Hovind was convicted of. Now, the first 12 counts were for willfully failing to deduct and pay federal income and withholding taxes for employees of evangelism enterprises. So I want to now introduce you to a couple of concepts. First, payroll taxes. Now we all pay payroll taxes if you work for a company, but what are payroll taxes? Well, let's understand it in this way. Companies that have employees generally must pay payroll taxes. Now these taxes come directly out of the employee's paycheck. Now you've probably heard of the term FICA, but FICA stands for the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. Now, some states also have similar income tax laws, but generally the way it works is that the employer pays a payroll tax for each employee. And the employee also pays a percentage of their income. So generally it's the responsibility of the employer to deduct, withhold, and submit those funds that they collect from the employee and they pay themselves to the government. Now, tax fraud is simply a taxpayer that could be an individual or a corporation a taxpayer's intent to defraud the government by not paying taxes that the taxpayer knows are lawfully due. There's a couple of things there. Taxpayer must know they're lawfully due and they have, must have an intent to defraud the government by not paying those taxes. Now, there's also a separate concept called tax evasion. And tax evasion usually entails a deliberate act of misrepresentation of taxable income to the IRS. Now, a common example of tax evasion is not declaring all of your income. You know, I, I've got $2 million worth of income, but I only declare $1 million of it in my tax return. So that, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at someone trying to say they have less income or they're trying to hide their income in some way to avoid paying those taxes. So how does this all relate to what happened in this particular case? Well, let's turn back to the court document. So the court concluded that Kent was charged with the first 12 counts of the indictment for willfully failing to deduct and pay federal income tax withholdings for his employees for evangelism enterprises. The court says the government proved that Kent knew the tax laws required the collection and payment of the withholding taxes, but refused to comply. The witnesses the government produced were employees of evangelism enterprises, Kent Hovind's peers, and legal counsel. Now these witnesses testified that Kent disputed the authority of the Internal Revenue Service based on the separation of church and state, debated the interpretation and application of the withholding requirements and intentionally characterized evangelism enterprises as a church and its employees as, as missionaries to avoid tax obligations. Kent even opinion to an attorney, David Gibbs, that he was smarter than other church officials who had forfeited real property after they refused to collect and pay withholding taxes. The jury found Kent Hovind guilty on all 12 counts, finding that he deliberately violated tax laws. For the first 12 counts of this indictment, which he was duly convicted, the jury found that not only did Kent know because the witnesses testified, he disputed it and then refused to do it. But now, how did he go about hiding this from the government? So this is where cash structuring comes in. Now, the indictment charged Mr. Hovind with 45 counts of cash structuring, specifically cash structuring cash withdrawals to avoid financial reporting requirements. So what is cash structuring? Because obviously this is not something that is in the common vernacular. We need to understand why cash transactions are important in this particular context. Now think about this. Most illegal activity um, occurs within cash transactions. But think about things like bribes, drug deals, prostitution. You're not swiping a credit card to pay for prostitutes or for your drugs. Generally, you're using cash. So cash itself is very hard to control and 
it creates what they call an underground economy. In the 1970s and 80s, the government passed laws requiring financial institutions to report cash transactions that were $10,000 or more to the IRS. And the way they would do that is file these reports called CTRs, or cash transaction reports. The government also made it illegal to structure cash withdrawals or deposits under $10,000 in an attempt to avoid having your bank file these cash transaction reports. Now these obviously these cash transaction reports were then turned over to the IRS to let them know that this type of activity was going on. Now this was an attempt by the government to prevent money laundering and help the government keep track of large trash transactions, creating a paper trail for these transactions. Now you understand that cash is virtually untraceable when it's within the economy. So this was a way to kind of track these large transactions as they move through the system. So here's an example of a common scheme in which you have cash structuring to avoid paying, let's say, payroll taxes. So let's say we have company X and all of its employees are paid with cash to avoid payroll taxes. To avoid the bank filing a cash transaction report, company X structures its cash withdrawals to under $10,000. See, what happens is if they took out $10,000 or more, then the bank would notify the IRS by filing a cash transaction report. So company X withdraws $9,999, or it could be $9,000. Company X then pays all of its employees in cash. Now, doesn't pay their payroll taxes, and the company doesn't pay the payroll taxes because these transactions were made in cash under the $10,000 mark. It allowed both the company and the employees to avoid detection. So what happened in this case? Well, here's the evidence that the government put forward, and this is directly from the opinion. The evidence established that Kent and Joe Hovind structured cash transactions with the knowledge and intent to avoid reporting those transactions to the government. Now, the government had witnesses. A former employee of Evangelism Enterprises, Brian Pomp, testified that Kent knew and complained of the bank reporting requirements and that Joe often, at Kent's direction, regularly obtained cash to pay employees of the organization. Other employees and associates of Kent testified that the Hovinds openly disputed the validity of tax laws. Various documents established that Joe withdrew cash in increments of 9500 bucks or 9600 bucks from AM South Bank as often as four to five times a month. Now, there was a total amount of 45 transactions between July 2001 and August 2002. Now, the jury specifically found that Kent and Joe Hoven knew about the reporting requirements and structured their cash transactions in an amount less than $10,000 to specifically prevent AM South Bank from reporting those trash transactions. And the jury convicted them on all 45 counts. The last count of the indictment was for Kent Hoven, and he was charged with obstructing the administration of the internal revenue laws. So overall, this case is a pretty simple case. What did the court find? Well, the court found that there was evidence sufficient to establish the defendants, Joe and Kent Hoven, willfully, willfully failed to collect and pay withholding taxes. The evidence was also sufficient to establish that the defendants structured cash transactions with the knowledge and the intent to avoid reporting those transactions. Evidence was also sufficient to establish that the defendants intended to impede the IRS agents in their efforts to investigate and prosecute their violations of tax laws. So it seems to be very clear. This was a scheme of we don't want to pay payroll taxes, so we'll pay everybody in the cash. And to avoid detection from the IRS, we'll take all of this money out in cash under $10,000 so the bank doesn't file the cash transaction report to the IRS, and no one will be the wiser. Thank you, Professor. So the reason I referred to inmate number 0645-2017 as a convicted fraud is because he was in fact found guilty on every count of a 58 count indictment where all but one of those verdicts actually does count as tax fraud and where the last one was a failed attempt to avoid prosecution for defrauding the IRS. Now, look at how many lies we've already counted just in the first 10 minutes of the first of my opponent's five 40 minute videos full of continuous distortions and distractions. It's only going to get worse. <laughs> Won't this be fun? I should warn 0645-2017 that he ought to stay on topic discussing one thing at a time like he said, but I already know he's going to bring up lots more topics to debate all at the same time and then blame me when he does. Uh, Mr. Nelson, I think I understand very well that 
frogs produce frogs and cows produce cows and there are no exceptions. And I understand and, and make real clear to people, no fossil counts. No fossil counts for anything in a court of law, in an honest court of law. When you find a fossil in the ground, all you can prove is it died. Which of course means that it also lived. It also means that it ate and that it grew to this level of maturity in an environment that would support that. None of the fossils I have seen, and we got a huge collection of them here, none of them have a date stamped on of them. On them. Which is both another indication that it wasn't created and is also the reason we need a geologic study of the matrix from which it was extracted so we can apply a few of the several different overlapping methods in dating these deposits. For example, where I found these was where a river had cut through all of the Cenozoic strata to reveal a Cretaceous beach where there were literally thousands of shells like this washed up on what was once the shore. Paleoclimatologists can tell a whole lot more about ancient biosystems than you want to admit. None of them talk. Yet they tell us so much. These tell us there were cephalopods living inside that were once abundant all over the world a long time ago but that don't exist anywhere at all anymore. You put interpretation on them, but your interpretation is not part of the fact. Nothing I've said so far is interpretation. Everything I've added is part of the fact. The fact is, this comes from a critter that died. That's the fact. Now, if you want to add more to that, you're welcome to, of course, but that's no longer science. Part of the science is that your critter was a mammal. So I can't see the fossil well enough to be sure of what type. I can't tell if those are molars or carnassals, but it looks like an artiodactyl and a relatively recent one at that. Is it? Because therein lies the importance of phylogeny, something you don't know anything at all about and you refuse to learn. So there are no fossils that would count in an honest court of law. Every fossil would be thrown out. You can't say this is intermediate between these two. You don't know that. You don't know if that fossil had any children at all. How could you possibly prove that? I don't have to. It's irrelevant. If you really understood anything you pretend to, you'd know that it doesn't matter whether that particular individual had any offspring or not, because we're not looking at any direct lineage of individuals. Evolution is a matter of population genetics and comparative morphology. Is that collective species or genus intermediate with some earlier or subsequent forms? Or is it a sister clade of some contemporary form? Are the features of a particular skeleton intermediate between this one and that? Because those are things we can measure to be sure, and that's how we know. And following the scientific method, we can also predict certain measurable variations that should occur in certain lineages in particular clade from a specific range of time and space. And these predictions are consistently fulfilled. Whereas, you are protecting and fortifying your incurious ignorance, what you ignore so that you don't have to understand or admit. You don't want to know what you don't want to believe. And keep lying to yourself that way if you must. But intellectually honest people watching either side of this debate will see that that is what you're doing and that it's not what I'm doing. I show specifically the 75 lies in the textbooks. Do the textbooks in your city, I don't even know where you live, nor care. Do, this, do the textbooks in your state teach that the embryo growing in the mother has gill slits like a fish? If so, that is a lie and you should know that if you've studied anything and that should be corrected. No, they describe pharyngeal arches or pharyngeal pouches, which really are there as shown in microphotographs. In fish, these do develop into gills and at that point you could fairly call them gill slits. But in tetrapods, the pharyngeal clefts do not develop slits. Instead, the pharyngeal arches that surround the clefts develop into parts of the ear and other structures like ducts and glands in the head and neck. It's described as a homologous feature which leads to the principle of evo-devo, which is how stages of embryological development show key parallels to evolutionary development. I show 75 specific lies that should be taken out of the textbooks. Such as? The human tailbone is not vestigial. Yes, it is. My textbook says every human embryo has a long bony tail, the vestige of which we carry into adulthood as the coccyx at the end of our spine. So that's not a lie. The human tailbone is also an evolutionary vestige, obviously, or that would be obvious if you knew what a vestigial trait is, which you evidently don't. And you guys are really excited about giving examples of what anybody else would call variations within the same kind, and you don't like the word kind, 
There's no such thing as a kind. You proved this yourself when over the course of a couple hours you couldn't answer the phylogeny challenge. You still don't even understand what that challenge is even after it was repeatedly explained to you. So no, I, this is correct. That, and this is what you atheists and evolutionists hate, that I point out where a fourth grader can understand there are six different levels to evolution. No. Just because you don't understand the rules doesn't mean you get to make up new ones. These other theories are not different levels of a larger theory. And the bottom two on your list are not different theories. They're part of the same theory, which is different from all the others. Produce any secular academic source wherein your index, you look up evolution and it shows the six categories you describe. You can't because every such source has always defined it the way I say and no science text ever defines it the way you say. You have to have organic evolution. Somehow life has to get started from non-living material. Please, how did life start from non-living material? How do you go from non-living to living? I point out if you put all, if you put a frog in a blender and turn it on and let it run for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, within a few, within 20 seconds, you will have frog nog. You will have all the materials, all the elements, all the atoms to make a frog in one's place. Now, nuke it, microwave it, lightning bolt it, do anything you want to it, okay? How long will it take to reassemble the frog? I will even give you all the frog elements in one bowl. Can you reassemble the frog? How did life get started? Water, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen generate amino acids when heated and charged with electricity. The same thing happens when you change the mix to include carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and sulfur dioxide. Peptides can form spontaneously, drying into polypeptides, because some of these chemicals become increasingly complex after cycles of repeated inundation, dehydration, and irradiation. Then once a plausible phosphate is introduced, you have ribonucleotides. If ribonucleotides come into contact with montmorillonite, they spontaneously produce strands of RNA. Activated RNA can not only replicate itself even without the usual enzyme, it also builds DNA. Then, of course, phospholipids automatically form a bilayered cell wall upon contact with water due to polarity, allowing a haven for all these processes with transport vesicles and such to keep fueling and exchanging the system. But the difference between scientific theories like the Big Bang, cell theory, gravity and relativity, and atomic theory, oxygen theory, evolution, and the germ theory of disease is that the sorted hypotheses of abiogenesis do not qualify as a theory because it hasn't been effectively proven yet like all these others have. Don't you remember how I explained it to you the last time? Organic evolution has to be separated out and studied independently because you guys don't have an answer for any of these first five. Yeah, we definitely do. But they're all from different disciplines because they're different theories from different sciences. Talk to a cosmologist about the Big Bang. Talk to a physicist about nucleosynthesis. I've already told you, I don't know either of those that well. But I can prove evolution even to your satisfaction if you were honest enough to admit what it really is. The discussion, whatever you want to call it, the discussion agreement was equal time. And that's only fair. So rather than say, oops, I'm wrong, Hovind, you're, I'm sorry, you only got 30-some minutes, I got 60-some, that wasn't right, was it? Here we go. I'm going to take six years on this one, Aaron, and I'm going to explain word by word where you are wrong, and we'll go back and forth on this until you get tired. I enjoy this. Not as much as I do. There was no agreement for equal time, as the hosts of that show have already confirmed in a public statement. So with no documentation to back you up, it's your word against mine and theirs. And you're a convicted fraud who's already told more than a dozen other lies just in this one video so far. So your word is worthless. See, I believe I'm going to face God one day for every word I've ever spoken, Matthew 12, 36, 7, and 8. I think you are too, whether you believe in it or not. We shall see. No, we won't. We won't see or know anything when we're dead. That's what being dead means. Show me a book that makes prophet it comes 100% correct. It was prophesied hundreds of years before it happened that a Messiah would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem. No, it didn't. It prophesied that within a couple of years, an unremarkable child born in Judah of an unmarried maiden would choose honey over curds, by which time the king would know that his Syrian and Israeli enemies would be no threat. But that prophecy failed every way that it can fail 
partly because the kingdom was invaded and everyone was killed. So Isaiah got all that wrong and everybody died because of it. You should see the video that I did on unfulfilled prophecies in the Bible, since you imagine some credence there that your fables haven't really earned. You believe you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago? No, I don't. We've been all over this. If frozen water doesn't count as a rock, which it doesn't, then the chemicals of which life is made don't count as rock either, especially when we're made of liquid and rock is solid by definition. Improbable claims. Does evolution claim that pine trees are related to whales? Being related in the sense that they're in the same taxonomic category of eukarya? Then yes, we can prove that that really is true. Does it claim that pine trees and whales came from an amoeba, which came from soup, which came from a rock? No, all of that is another example of your childish misunderstanding that you're so proud of. Hovind and his followers believe something that is improbable? Yes, you believe everything in the universe was conjured by an incantation spoken by the equivalent of a genie and that the first man was constructed with a golem spell because you believe in a collection of fairy tales with talking animals and magical enchantments that is not supported by any evidence at all. Can you show me something that has been proven wrong from the Bible? Oh yes, absolutely. Everything the Bible says about the nature of the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos is laughably wrong, being written from the perspectives of ignorant, superstitious primitives who thought the world was flat. But to answer your question specifically, I published an eight-part series showing how different fields of science have proven that the global flood of Noah's Ark never really happened, nor could have. Links below. Has the archaeologist proven anything wrong? Yes, even rabbinical scholars now admit that the truth is that virtually every modern archaeologist who has investigated the story of the Exodus, with very few exceptions, agrees that the way that the Bible describes the Exodus is not the way it happened, if it happened at all. They've discovered, like, the Hittite civilization. The Bible talked about the Hittites. Nobody heard of the Hittites for hundreds of years, and all of a sudden, bing, they find evidence of the Hittites. Whoa! They also discovered the city of Troy and Rama's bridge. But neither of these things proves Hellenism nor Hinduism. All of the claims that I'm aware of in the Bible that can be verified have been verified. No, there is no truth to the Bible at all. There are mentions of famous people and places just like any work of fiction might have, but nothing to show that any of the stories are true, nor could they be. I think there's overwhelming evidence that the Bible is true. No, there is absolutely no evidence at all that anything in the Bible is even possible and much of that was adopted and adapted from elder polytheism, and we still have the original copies of those older stories, so there's literally no reason to believe any of it. There is a dog kind. Does anybody know any examples where any dog has produced anything non-dog? Mm -hmm. Now, I've had atheists tell me, well, of course, going forward, they're always going to produce dogs. Well, let's wind the clock backwards. Do you believe somewhere, somehow, long ago, far away, I'll give you trillions of years, did a dog come from something that would be non-dog? Answer that one in your response. Yes, though it does depend on what you mean by dogs. Domestic dogs, Canis lupus familiaris, were derived from Asiatic wolves roughly 10,000 years or so ago, if I remember correctly. But not all dogs came from wolves. Wolves are canids themselves, and there are several species of wild dogs that cannot interbreed with domestic dogs, and these refute your notion of dog kinds. Wild dogs are closely related to bears, and this isn't just an estimate based on morphology. This was confirmed genetically. And while there are bear dogs and dog bears in the fossil record, fossils like Hesperocyon represent an undifferentiated ancestor of both bears and dogs. There are also giant bone-crushing barophagines that are often referred to as dogs, but in fact they were more distantly related to modern dogs than foxes are, and nobody thinks of foxes as being dogs. And there are procyonids that are even older than that, but I don't think you're ready for that yet. If you think you are, you can check out my videos on caniform cladogram construction and the foundations of filiform families. I'll put the links below. The point is that the first dogs came from a canid, and they're still canids now. And the first canids came from conoidia, which they still are now, and those all began with carnivora, which they still are now, because the law of biodiversity and the law of monophyly allow that new daughter varieties can emerge, but they will still belong to every clade their ancestors did. You can't grow out of your ancestry, which is why asking for a dog producing a non-dog is complete nonsense 
and it shows that you don't know what evolution is or what it teaches. Could Lucy, if it is intermediate between humans and chimps, I don't think it is, but if it is, maybe that's a line that's gone extinct. Maybe God created a creature like that that has now gone extinct. You can't prove either way. So it's not science is my point. It's a religious belief. No, it isn't, and not just because it has nothing to do with faith or the supernatural, but because humans and apes are already so close to each other that Carolus Linnaeus, who was a creationist living a century before Darwin, said that chimpanzees and orangutans were human, and that humans were apes. So Lucy, chimpanzees, and humans are all in the same category to begin with. We are literally in the same family, so I guess you could say we're the same kind. Linnaeus challenged the scientific community to explain that fact because Linnaeus believed that species were immutable, special creations by God that could not evolve. Darwin answered that challenge by showing how new species could evolve from within ancestral clades, like the several new species of Galapagos finches, for example. Their evolution allowed for new kinds of finches, but never allowed a finch to produce a non-finch. Darwin already knew about Homo erectus, which you would probably call an ape man, depending on which one you're looking at. There was a lot of biodiversity in that species, and you've referred to some of them as if they were regular people, despite the heavy brow and the tiny brain. That says something, I think. Darwin predicted that if his theory was true, then we should find a species of ape that is morphologically halfway between Homo erectus and the apes that we knew of at that time. Australopithecus afarensis proved to be a fully bipedal ape whose hands, feet, teeth, pelvis, skull, and other physical details precisely fulfilled Darwin's prediction of a missing link. Hundreds more individuals have since been discovered from her species, as well as thousands more individuals representing dozens more intermediate species found since then, all of which add further confirmation and completely blur the line between us such that it is still impossible to distinguish man from ape. Evolutionism is, goes along with communism, socialism, Marxism, Nazism. It's a very legitimate word, okay? except that you can't find it in the dictionary because it's not a legitimate word. At best, it's a pejorative distortion of a legitimate word. I said, Aaron, give me your three best evidences for evolution. And finally, at the end, you said, biodiversity is proof for evolution. You said, taxonomy is proof for evolution. And you said, the theory itself, the body of knowledge, the fact that there's so much information about it, that's proof for evolution. We'll get there in a couple of weeks, okay. Now this covers one of the five episodes uploaded in response to the 20 minute video that I posted at the start of this debate. I downloaded that first video, but didn't get around to downloading the other ones yet. I was gonna do them all in turn. And now I see that Hovind has made them all private. I don't know why. I don't know if he answered my questions therein, but based on his performance so far, I, I'd have to guess not. I haven't even seen those other videos yet, but others who have say that I didn't miss much, that all he did was pointlessly insult me, which is what he did throughout most of this video too. I just edited most of that out because his petty bitterness and projection is beside the point. Stick to the topic. So I guess I don't have to respond to all that other nonsense after all. And there probably won't be any more debate after this post, unless Hovind wants to make those other videos available again, and I'll be here if he's up to it. Oh. One last thing, maybe there should be some kind of a poll to show whether I made my point or whether, you know, whether somehow somebody bought into his point about what evolution is and whether it includes those six categories. I'd like to have some kind of you know, goal to be achieved in this thing, so I'm out. <laughs>